Guys, congratulations on the movie, first of all. I absolutely loved it, like I think everybody does, every Pixar movie. Um, the concept people will kind of straight away, I think, go, why do a movie about the, the, the dead, I suppose, the skeletons in this, is the afterlife? Was there worries at all or concerns when this idea first came up that maybe it's a bit too spooky? No, because I think we, we always knew we weren't trying to make a spooky movie. The intention was never to make a scary movie. Um, we wanted to make a movie that really celebrated this beautiful tradition. And the tradition itself, while death is a part of it, it's more about life and family and this obligation we have to remember our loved ones and tell their stories. And that's what really what we wanted to embrace, along with uh, all the beauty of Mexico, how colorful, how musical it can be. That's what we wanted to celebrate. And it really is, it's, it's, it's an amazing tradition. I only knew a little bit about it before I saw the film. So did you guys have to, in the team, have to do a lot of research? Did you get to go to Mexico and do that? I'd like have a bit of fun maybe the two while you're there? Absolutely. We did, yeah. We, we jumped on a plane right away uh, six years ago and went everywhere where they celebrate uh, Dia de Muertos. We went down to Mexico City and all of the regions down south, Oaxaca, Michoacan, all those areas. And... We took hundreds of thousands of photographs, and but most importantly, we hung out with some amazing families and uh, celebrated with them, and they were extraordinarily generous. It was very fun. Okay, and you say six years ago. I think yeah. anybody who understands this business knows that it takes a long time to make these movies. So I was wondering, mm -hmm. how many versions of the story do you go through before you go, okay, that's the one? Because once you start animating and all that, I assume it's too late to be changing stuff. Correct. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, early on, that's the time to kind of try things out and, uh, you know, uh, maybe pursue some ideas that don't come um, to fruition. Uh, we had a few ideas early on. There was an idea that I pitched, which was different than the first idea we then developed. And, and then ultimately we, we scrapped that and came up with this story about a little boy who wants to be a musician, but who lives in a family that doesn't allow music. Okay. And that was the one we ended up uh, feeling like was working well, and that's what we pursued, and that's what became Coco. Okay, and as we mentioned, he goes into the, the land of the dead, which is this colorful, amazing world. And when you, it's, it's, it's so imaginative. So how did you come up with what was going to be in this land? Because Nobody really knows, I suppose. You know, you had to invent it. Yeah, we couldn't go on a research trip then. To the yeah. land. <laughs> I don't think we, we could have returned from that <laughs> research trip. Um, you know, we, I, I watched a lot of movies that had a depiction of heaven or an afterlife, and um, my goal was to try to create a vision of a world that was different than anything anyone had ever seen, and to create a, a land of the dead that was quintessentially Mexican. And so there were a lot of things that inspired us uh, to create this world. There was a city in Mexico called Guanajuato that uh, is this beautiful um, city that's filled with really colorful buildings encrusted into a hillside. Yeah. And uh, that ended up being a big visual influence. Um, we also wanted to create a, a land of the dead that felt like it had layers of history, like it had been constantly growing over time. So mm -hmm. there, there are these giant towers that fill the land of the dead that come up from the water. And at the base of every one of those towers is an Aztec pyramid. And, and then if you, if you look, the buildings slowly kind of uh, encrust up over time and represent layers of, of history in Mexican architecture. Okay. And um, it was all in an effort to create a magical world that was uh, different than anything anyone who had seen but felt very rooted in the history of Mexico. Okay, and people noticing from the, f the poster behind you, the skeletons have uh, real eyeballs in, in the film, and I read that the reason for this is, is so we can connect, because is it true, is, are the eyes what we really connect with with their characters on the screen? I didn't realize this. the windows to the soul. Yeah, I mean, it sounds like a cliche, but the eyes are the windows to the soul, and uh, when we look at each other, we're always looking in each other's eyes, and, um, most skeletons have been depicted without eyes, um, and I think it makes them a little spookier. Uh, but also, I, I, I felt like I was never going to be able to really connect on a deep emotional level with a skeleton character that didn't have eyes, so we made okay. the decision early on to give them eyeballs. Okay, and the casting process for this, I believe it's an old Latino vo voice cast. That's right. Is that right? Yeah. Was, that, was that an important like, decision made at the beginning of this, and how did you go about casting the movie? Yeah, it was yeah, very important to us that be all Latino cast from the very, very beginning. And then we went about it, our normal kind of casting process where we audition a lot of people, we listen to a lot of people's uh, voices from their audition tapes, and we watch a lot of films and so on. And 
Uh, so it was very, uh, very exciting. And a lot of people wanted to be a part of this film. So it was fun. And what was one of the hardest was maybe casting Miguel? Like as the main, I suppose, character in the film was that was he hard to find? He, he was. was. It's always was hard. Yeah. It's always hard yeah. to find kids who can act. Okay. Naturally. Yes. You know. Yeah. Um, you know, so many kid actors have been through lots of acting school training, or their parents really coach them, and and so they start to get a little phony. Yeah. And uh, we, you know, we really wanted to find a kid who was believable and really natural. And um, so we we auditioned hundreds and hundreds of boys all over the United States and Mexico over a long period of time, and then uh, thankfully one day we found Anthony Gonzalez, who lives in Los Angeles. He's an amazing kid. He's been singing mariachi music since he was a little, very little boy. Oh, really? Um, he's an amazing actor, singer, uh, uh, just fabulous all around. And I almost can't separate Anthony from the yeah. character of Miguel. They're kind of one in the okay. same to me. Yeah. He's brilliant, but the whole cast are, and as usual, Everybody, I think, on the screen ends up blubbering and crying at some point, like you do at every Pixar movie. <laughs> is that part of the deal when you are doing that brainstorming, going, well, we need the bit where everybody's going to be in, in bits on the floor in tears, <laughs> like you set out to ruin us? Well, I think, it's, I think it's not so much about, like, there's an obligation to make people cry, as we just want, we, we want the audience to feel something. Um, you know, you can tell a story that doesn't have deep emotion in it, and that's fine, but I think that it's not going to necessarily stick with you after you leave the theater. Okay. And um, we, it, it is always important to us for there to be an emotional core to the story that we're telling. And in this case, you know, we came up with an ending that just happened to be a real tear-jerking ending. Yeah. Um, but it just felt like the right ending for this story. Okay. And, and underlying the whole thing, I think the reason why this it connected with me, it is basically about the importance of family. Fundamentally, you have this whole world and the land of the dead, but fundamentally, there's family, how important family are. Mm -hmm. Do you, is that really important with the Pixar film, that there is a universal theme that's going to work for everything? Because obviously this is Mexico, this is the land of the dead, but really this film, anybody could watch it anywhere, right? Yeah, we do try to think about yeah. that. I mean, we do, yeah. with any story that we tell, we want to know that it's tapping into some kind of universal human truth. Yeah. For sure. I mean, me, the, these films go everywhere around the world, and we want um, everyone to connect. We want the whole family. We want kids and grown-ups and everybody to connect. So we try our best to create stories that will appeal to everyone. And by the way, that's really hard to do, to um, create a satisfying experience for all ages. And it was especially important on Coco because the story itself is so culturally specific. Mm -hmm. We wanted to make sure that people didn't feel like this was a movie for someone else, but it was a movie that everyone could relate to. Yeah. Okay. And lastly, you're, you're both obviously majorly involved with Toy Story 3. Um, you, do you have a favorite Pixar film, I wanted to ask? Because there's so many now that are so huge and obviously so brilliant. Do you have a favorite, and is it one you've probably made? <laughs> <laughs> well, right now it's Coco. I think our favorite, our favorite's typically whatever we worked on last. <laughs> but um, I don't know. We, when we think back on the movies, our memories are more about the making of the movies and the people that we worked with on those movies. So th those are our fond memories rather than the movies themselves. Um, and we had a great time making Coco. It was really a special thing for everyone at the studio to be working on. And it's a really special movie. Congratulations, guys, and thanks Thank for you. coming to Dublin. Thank, Thank you. you. Cheers. Yeah. FM 104. Dublin's hit music station.